So uh, this session will be about EOSC. Uh, EOSC uh, has started as a very simple idea. Let's make all data fair and open. Like, uh, let's make a flying car. Very simple idea. And it has become quite a uh, complicated, complicated exercise. Uh, now I'm instructed to switch in uh, Slovene for a few minutes. Uh, so, uh, uh, Predstavo vam bom uh, naslednega uh, panelista. Uh, Dr. Juan Bikaregi je vodja sektorja za podatke na oddelku za znanstveno računalništvo pri Science and Technology Facilities Council. Uh, ta, uh, to je neodvisna ustanova, ki deluje pod pristojnostjo Britanskega ministarstva za gospodarstvo, energijo, industrijsko strategijo in je bila ustanovljena uh, leta 2007 je ena večjih uh, multidisciplinarnih raziskovalnih organizacij in ima zaposlenih okoli 2000 ljudi. Uh, ima približno 800 milijonov letnega uh, proračuna in ima trenutno aktivnih uh, tudi 800 razpisov v skupni vrednosti malo pod pol uh, milijarde uh, evrov. Uh, Dr. Juan Bikaregi se ukvarja z uh, raziskavami in uh, razvojem podatkovnih sistemov za obdelavo znanstvenih podatkov. So oblikoval je politiko Združenega kraljestva glede odprtega dostopa do rezultatov raziskav in bil je tudi član usmerjevalne skupine, ki je ustanovila Združenje za raziskovalne podatke in tako tudi sodeluje z RDA Research Data Alliance. Uh, trenutno je koordinator projekta EOSC Pilot, ki podpira prvo fazo razvoja evropskega oblaka odprte znanosti. So, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Juan, uh, I introduced you as uh, a coordinator of EOSC Pilot. Uh, EOSC Pilot uh, has, been has been funded by European Commission to help European Commission to start with initial phase of uh, EOSC process and also to create lo long longer term vision uh, for the EOSC. So majority of the task uh, for each pilot would go around uh, how to develop a service architecture which is based on interoperability, how to enable common use of e-infrastructures with emphasis of uh, collaborations uh, across disciplines, uh, community building and determine of uh, the future governments policy and purpose of uh, EOSC and also a lot of other activities. Uh, but let's just put this into the perspective. In Slovenia, we have around uh, 20 archives or repositories for uh, e-data, and we have maybe a couple of dozens uh, scientific communities uh, which are spread over uh, different disciplines. Uh, but yet, in Slovenia, it's very, very hard to uh, organize uh, all these uh, architectures, events, communities uh, in the way that uh, public, uh, publicly financed uh, scientific, uh, scientific uh, processes actually, the, 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 the results are uh, published openly um, and on the fair uh, principles. And uh, you can imagine in Europe you have plethora of different uh, researchers, research communities, uh, architectures, uh, uh, archives, uh, repositories. So the le level of EOSC is on complete, the, the, the creation of, of EOSC is on completely different level. And uh, I would uh, now ask Dr. Juan uh, Bicarega to explain us more about EOSC and related process, processes and activities, please. So hello, everybody. Um, and thank you for that introduction. And thank you for the invitation to talk here. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk about EOSC. I've been doing it for a while, and I continue to do it for many years in future, I hope, um, because I think this really is a, a very major initiative. Um, I think a lot of the talks we've had this morning, and I apologize for missing the very beginning of the conference as I had to come in this morning, um, have been talking about how we got here. Um, and I thought since I was speaking last, I would try and give a picture of where we're going from here. So what's next? So I called the talk, What's Next? I'm going to cover three things. Um, 
what is it we're trying to achieve? Um, what do we need to do to achieve that? And what will it look like when we get there? And I'll give some slides that are kind of formal texts from various documents, but quite a lot of slides that are just pictures. And to me, the pictures mean something. And I hope they'll mean something to you by the end of the talk. But sometimes people may come up to me afterward the talk and say, oh, you've shown a lot of pictures. They mean something to you, but they mean nothing to me. So I'll let you judge during the talk whether these pictures uh, convey a meaning or not. OK, so what are we trying to achieve? Here is the formal piece of text that's been quoted a lot. It's from the implementation roadmap. And um, I just pulled out a few phrases that, um, that kind of set the scope of what we're talking about. Uh, the first is that it's about research data management. And the objective is that European scientists should be able to get the full benefits from the data-driven science. I think it's unquestionable that uh, the research today is very, very much focused on data. And the more we can use that data and get more benefit from that data, the better. Um, it's going to be a virtual environment. It says free at the point of use with open and seamless services. That's a grand ambition, right? Open and seamless services, everything interacting perfectly. But we at least set the target there, and then we have to work out how we get from where we are today. Uh, we were just hearing that with, with, even within the repositories in Slovenia, it's already a task to try and get them to work together. To imagine doing that across the whole of Europe, it's a, it's a very ambitious uh, objective. But it's clear, it's good to know what we're aiming at. Um, and then some examples of the things that we're talking about. We're talking about storage, management, analysis, reuse of data. And we're talking about doing this across borders and across disciplines. And those two uh, dimensions are very important. A lot of the motivation comes from the researchers. And the researchers really think in disciplines. And so in a lot of disciplines, we already have infrastructures that work across borders. And also, in some of the horizontal services, as they're called, in terms of the network and access to HPC and things, we already have uh, some infrastructures that work across borders, sorry, that work across disciplines, and, but less so across borders. Some of those are national things uh, across disciplinary. So, you know, we have to try and take the best of each side and, and bring it all together. Um, so here's a diagram that's supposed to sort of convey why are we doing this. Well, we're, we're trying to increase innovation. We're trying to increase the discovery of new knowledge and the innovation that comes from that knowledge. And if you look at this diagram, you can see it as two different cycles. On the right-hand side, we've got the research process where it's about knowledge creation. It's about improving our understanding of the world. And it's about depositing the results of that, in, that research, um, that, that new knowledge, into the body of knowledge. On the left-hand side of the diagram, it's about the innovation process. This is maybe more what the governments try to do through various initiatives. It's about wealth creation and improving the quality of the life of the citizens. And that is building on the back of the knowledge that is coming from the uh, research, research life cycle. Um, and I'll come back to that diagram in a minute to see how that might change if we implement the infrastructure that we're talking about here. Um, so now let's. Looking at the right-hand side of that, the research life cycle, there's many stages, and it's in a cycle. And there are many versions of this diagram that lots of people have used. And here, I forced every step to begin with C, just for, to be clever, as it were. Um, so we start by forming collaborations. The collaborations create something, create papers, create knowledge, create data, whatever it is. If it's data, we want to store that somewhere. We do some computation on that, so some analysis. We curate the outcomes of that. We collect together outcomes from different resources, different experiments, different research, and communicate that through papers or any other means. And then that communication leads to new collaborations and new research. The way we're trying to change this, oh, sorry, the top half of that is what's commonly called open access. It's about the collaboration, the communication of papers. The lower half of this, if we open that up, that's around open data. And the thing as a whole is called open science. Sorry. Um, now, what are we trying to change? Well, we're trying to communicate at every stage in this life cycle. Instead of waiting for a paper to be published to communicate the results of the research, we want to communicate those as soon as possible, so even during the research. Now, we've already had questions about incentives and motivations and scooping and all that. So these are all barriers that we have to be aware of. But the more, the earlier we can communicate the results, then the earlier that the communication can lead to new collaborations. So we also want new collaborations to be formed at every stage in the life cycle. And this would really change the way things are done, and it accelerates everything. Um, but as I said, bearing in mind that the current cycle has 
barriers to this. If we think about those two um, new aspects, it makes much better to put the uh, collaboration and communication in the center of something so it's no longer a life cycle. It's a series of activities, each, each of which is depositing something in this common repository, this common infrastructure that can be shared, that can be communicated, that can start new collaborations and be reused in different ways. If you apply that same thinking to this diagram, you get a similar kind of uh, diagram where all of these different stages are all happening at once and are all putting the results of each process into the body of knowledge when it happens, rather than waiting for a paper to be written. As if the, the Ingrid said, the, pa the fair paper itself took two years to be published for when the ideas were coming. We don't want to wait two years for all these ideas to be put out there into the public. The infrastructure that will enable that could be called the European Open Science Cloud, can also be called an open data science environment. This is praise I actually prefer myself. This was in the 2015 ministerial communication um, from, the G7, from the G7 ministers. So they call this an open data science environment. And that's the phrase that I think really explains what we're trying to do. So that's what are we trying to achieve? What do we need to make it happen? Well, here's a diagram that um, I picked up from a, an, a report that was written by the EIRG, the E-Infrastructure Reflection Group, back in 2013. And it's really describing the infrastructure situation as it was then, and, and to a large extent still is now. Um, we have some vertical or domain-specific research infrastructures. We heard before about Elixir and EMBL is one example of a domain-specific research infrastructure absolutely essential to the researchers in that domain absolutely targeted on supporting the research in that domain, and that's excellent, that's what needs to happen, but with not so much sharing across domains of the, of the underlying infrastructure. On the other hand, we have horizontal infrastructures. Uh, the research network is one of them. It's very reassuring to be able to come here and go into Eduroam and, and not have any problem with that. That's one of the major achievements over the last 10 years or so that that now works across the world. It's a fantastic achievement. Uh, it's taken a while, but at least we've got that now, I think. Um, the sharing of high-performance computing, for example, through praise and, and things like this are other examples of horizontal infrastructures that are used in a cross-disciplinary way, some of them across borders as well. And then the overlap of those two, uh, here talking about greater sharing of resources and data, is the thing, is the area where we want to focus. We want to see where can those horizontal activities, horizontal research infrastructures and the vertical ones uh, interact better. So in here we've made a sort of cloud-shaped thing in purple, the mixture of red and blue, that is supposed to be where, where the European Open Science Cloud um, is focused. And as well as sort of being a merge of the horizontal and the vertical infrastructures, it's also an opportunity to build upwards. So above the three layers of blue that I had before, we've now put an interdomain catalog of services. So the idea there is if, if, the, if something developed by one domain is of use to another, they should just be able to access it without too much work on the part of the user. Eventually, with no work, but let's start off with let, not too much work. So there's greater sharing across domains as well. It's an infrastructure to enable greater sharing across domains. Now, so they call this merging the horizontal and vertical infrastructures. Of course, that means some building, and to build things, we need uh, real resources. We need projects. And there's a program in for EOSC uh, in the Horizon 2020 uh, program, which has maybe 20 or 30 action lines, and I've put a few of them on this diagram to show what projects are involved already today in building this infrastructure and building across the infrastructure. So here we have some horizontal projects. Um, RDA was already mentioned by, um, by Ingrid, and so was Fair's Fair. Um, there's, there are others at the higher level that are about portal and access to portal into various services. There's a catalog of services. There's Open Air, which is about supporting and sharing of data and, and papers. So these are horizontal projects, and they're also vertical ones. Here I've put the five so-called S3 cluster projects in the different domains in um, environmental science, life science, uh, physics, photon and neutron science, and social science and humanities. So this is a cluster, already a clustering together of domain-specific infrastructures, 
and in starting by clustering together the ones that are in related domains. And I think it's kind of obvious that that's where you would start. It's much less of a driver to share particle physics data with social science than there is to share across different life sciences. So this is uh, just to try and picture there the fact that there are real projects doing real things and now, more increasingly, every one of those is taking an open science perspective in its work program because that's being driven by the funder, quite rightly. So, uh, so those are the projects. Those are how we're actually going to build this infrastructure. There's also got to be a governance structure. I'm not sure if Rene gave a slide like this before I came in. This is the, uh, the, the, the sort of five different areas of governance that are currently being developed. Uh, Peter is a member of the governance board. So the governance board has a representative per member state and associated country. Um, and that's overseeing you know, the, the funders' contribution to it, the national contribution and the national uh, strategic perspective. The executive board, which is charged with actually doing the coordination to make the projects deliver something in common. There will be a, a stake, the stakeholders forum. There were already two events uh, once per year under the EOS pilot project, which are really about bringing the community together. And those will continue, and I think over time, they will take more of a, a steering and directing role rather than a just sort of a being told role, bringing the community in to give advice into the structure. And then two other bodies, the, the, at the bottom of the diagram, the projects that I already mentioned, this has to be built, and building takes really quite considerable resource, and so the projects are there. And those resources were already there, if you like. They were already building their specific infrastructures. And the idea is to coordinate across the projects that are there to try and, and build an infrastructure that is more shared. And then there's going to be set up now some working groups reporting to the executive board that will, um, uh, that will sort of steer specific areas of work. And there are five of those initially, and there will be more in the near future. Um, where we will get experts together to deliver on certain topics, and I'll mention the five working groups that already exist in a moment. Um, this is just the membership of the executive board. I don't need to go into that, but it's uh, 11 people across various infrastructures and some individual experts as well. Um, so I will just talk briefly about the five working groups that are starting up about now, just in the final stages of, of getting the membership um, set. Um, and these are really coordinating different areas of work that need to happen. So there's one working group on landscape. Um, the EOS is something new, but it's built by putting things together that already exist. Nobody is saying we're going to throw away the existing infrastructures and build something new. What we're going to do is try and work in terms of standardization, in technological standards, service standards, etc., to try and integrate the working infrastructures that are already there, because the last thing we want to do is, is to step backwards. This is about stepping forwards from where we are. So there's one group that is looking at the landscape that's already there so that we know what our baseline is. Um, there's one group looking at FAIR data practice, and you've just heard from Ingrid about, about FAIR, so I, I won't go into that anymore. I think this is really a looking across the different domains and trying to identify where the commonalities are, where the differences are, bringing that all together. There's a group on architecture, which is absolutely crucial from a technical point of view, which is about developing the standards, the technologies that can be shared in order to enable the different domains, the different horizontals and the different verticals to work together. Um, a lot of this will be about standardization, and RDA will be one of the vehicles that drives that standardization, that agrees that. Very importantly, this has to work at a global level as well. The domains, the research, happens at a global level. We cannot have a solution that works only in Europe but doesn't allow European life scientists to work with American life scientists. That would be absolutely impossible. So it has to be done at a global level, and RDA is a global organization, so it's one way that those standards can be discussed at a global level. Rules of participation, which I'm uh, chairing. The name sounds a little bit bureaucratic. I don't think it's about uh, the reason we have rules of participation. You have to think about why do we have rules of participation. If I'm going to provide some data on EOSC, why should there be any constraints on that? Well, you have to look at it from the user's point of view. When the user comes to um, look at, use something that's available through EOSC, they have to know the quality of that. They have to have some assurance of quality. It's actually one of the sub-bullets under the R of the FAIR is about the provenance of the data, for example. And if you're going to have provenance of data, if you're going to have quality assurance of the services that are provided, then you have to have rules when you start putting things in there. 
So, albeit at the beginning, there will probably be a very low barrier to entry, we have to have some way so that eventually whatever is provided through EOSC has its own provenance, ha is accessible about its quality, and in order to do that, you have to have rules about what you put in. And then finally, sustainability. Currently, EOSC is being built through 20 or so big projects. We have to worry, think about how do we uh, continue that into the long term beyond the current funding cycle into Horizon Europe. What's the vehicle for sustaining the, the cooperation and for doing the oversight to enable that cooperation to happen? So those are the five groups that will start their work now. Most of them run for about 18 months. The current governance framework that I showed you on the slide previously is in place until the end of 2020, by which time there'll be something new come under Horizon Europe. So that's kind of the baseline. That's where we are now. I think there is a lot of topics that have still to be discussed. Some of them have been discussed here today already. Um, so I'll just uh, give you three ideas, uh, sort of the what and, and who and how. Um, this first thing, looking at that phrase, open data science environment, you can parse this, you can understand this in different ways. You can say it's a science environment for open data, and that's definitely something that it has to be. You can also say it's an open environment that has the data of science in it. So the word open can either be applied to the data or the environment. So one is about data standards, data formats, data, metadata, and all those things. The other is about technologies, in a, technologies that enable interoperation at the technical level of the various services and software components. So it needs to be an open data and it needs to be an open environment. Again, so that partly so that we can plug together existing things and so that we can also interoperate with things that are going on outside Europe. So under that thought, um, we can think, well, what does fair data mean in practice? What does open data really mean? Of course, we've just heard Ingrid talking about that. What does it mean to share resources? Are we talking about federation or are we talking about merging? Are we talking about bringing data together and putting it all in one place and maybe put, making a transformation as it comes together so it's all there in one form? Or are we talking about accepting that this is a distributed data source that we need to somehow federate to enable cross-searching and things like that? And different, there's no right answer to that question. Different answers will be right for different situations. So we have to accept that there'll be both of those models and all the in-between models as well. Um, what does it look like to the users? Are they go, is every one of those 1.7 million researchers going to the same portal and doing their science through that portal? I don't believe that. And I'll come back to my diagrams in a minute to emphasize that. So what does it mean? Are the, are the users going to the same portal they always were? And how is it richer than it would have been otherwise? So portal or portal, so I'll come back to that later. How will we do that? As I, I said, we've got to think about things. The rules of participation are crucial. Otherwise, we won't know what we've got when we use EOSC. And you can't do science if you don't know the provenance of the things you're using. So that's crucial. Uh, we have to worry about data stewardship models. We have to worry about the business model. In that initial sentence that I gave you right at the start, it says free at the point of use. Does that mean everything that's available through EOSC is free at the point of use? Or does it mean some of the things are free at the point of use? Obviously, the things aren't free to provide, so somebody is getting paid somehow. So what, what, where are the money flows that are enabling things to be available free at the point of use? And then, of course, we have to worry about ethical questions. Uh, protection of personal data would be one, but also sometimes the scientific data itself has to be protected. Uh, an example I like is about the location of rare bird species. For example, it's a scientifically interesting thing. It doesn't have a protection of personal data angle, but if you make it known, soon, soon those birds would be even more rare than they are now. So there are other areas where ethical considerations have to come in as well as protection of personal data. So who is this about? Well, who's, who should be engaged? How are we going to organize the communication? Um, 1.7 million researchers, there's a lot of people to communicate with. It's clear, it's clear that we're not going to sort of um, not have them in the EOSC today, and tomorrow they'll all be using the EOSC. It has to be a progressive thing. So how do we target the communication? How do we bring the users in in the most sensible way so that we uh, get build momentum in the right way? Who is this user base exactly? Um, what are the user skill sets? Can we ask them to do something differently than they're currently doing? I'll come back to that one as well. 
who are the providers? How will we integrate the other national initiatives? So all the, the majority of the research infrastructure and the research uh, funding is coming through national initiatives. So we have to find a way of bringing all those different national things together um, to build a European thing. And how will we integrate with ex things outside of Europe? I already said from the sort of standards point of view, RDA is one way of having a global conversation, but in other areas we also have to have a global conversation. How can we make sure that happens properly? These are all open questions that I think really have to be considered now. So in summary, um, I've given you this, what are we trying to achieve? So I'm not at the summary yet. What are we trying to achieve? The next thing is what will it look like when we have it? Um, so I talked about the clustering of projects. These five S3 clusters are already clusters of separate infrastructures. So in this diagram, I'm trying to sort of give a bit more shape to what we've got before when we're clustering <laughs> different infrastructures first, the related ones, the ones where we see immediate cross-disciplinary benefit. And then we have a cluster of clusters, and eventually we bring those together. That's on the sort of vertical side. But notice that I've expanded the bottom end because it's easier to share things lower down in the technology stack than it is higher up. So down at the bottom here, we have data storage, we have networking, we have compute. As you go up the stack, it becomes more difficult, more domain specific. On the horizontal side, well, we've got some cross-disciplinary infrastructure already. Um, what are the next steps? Well, we, we can try sharing methods and software and workflows. We build this, this sea of provenance fair data, some of, the, some of the sort of commercial cloud type uh, commercial organizations talk about data lakes. Don't like the idea of a lake, because in a lake things flow in and uh, and, and out again. A, a C, I think, is more, is more what it is because it's connecting different countries and things like that. Anyway, the C of provenance fair data, and then we have an interdomain catalogue of services, which is there available but is not at the top. And you'll see in this next diagram, the top of each of these clusters is sticking up through there. So my own personal view is the individual researcher is still using the portal that they always used. And maybe, if they're not doing anything new, they don't even see a transition. But what they get offered is a greater breadth of services. So as well, when they're using the data set they've always used, somehow the other data sets are available and can be offered to them, and some sort of system which recognizes where what's likely to be of use to them. But if they don't want to touch that, they can carry on as was, because I think the existing infrastructures do their job, and we don't want to break them. So at the top here, we have the individual portals that are tuned to the specific domain as well. If I'm a researcher in one domain, I don't want to be bothered with stuff from somewhere else, probably. I only want to see the stuff I'm interested in. So it's very difficult to imagine a global portal that will not clutter things with irrelevant stuff. So I think at the top, it doesn't look that different. It's just the functions that are available are broader because at the lower levels of the stack, things are shared more. Um, so how do we achieve that kind of invisibility? And what's the benefit? If it looks the same to the re researcher, why is it any different? So let's focus at the data that's at the heart of this, at the heart of my diagram with the two cycles that I had earlier. It's not just one great big data repository, obviously. It's a distributed data repository that is somehow brought together um, and shareable. What do researchers do? Well, they create some data. They want it stored for a while, and then they're going to access it later. They're going to do analysis. It's clearly oversimplified for the sake of making the diagram look nice. But So this is uh, what the researchers do. They create the archive. And what do you need to enable that? You need a, a, an infrastructure underneath, an e-infrastructure, a data infrastructure, which includes storage and compute and networking and a whole bunch of services and curation services, analysis services, et cetera. If you think about this diagram, you can look at two different dimensions. The red dimension before, which I talked about the verticals, the domain-specific stuff, is now horizontal in this diagram, and it's the virtual research environment that the researcher works in. They're creating their data, they're putting it somewhere, they're getting it later, it's supporting the analysis they're doing. But really, the vertical part here, which is the sort of information infrastructure that allows that all to happen, if the researcher didn't know that was there, didn't have to worry about that, that would be good. They should not have to worry about how the data is kept from one year to the next. They should not have to worry that the network works, that the compute services work. 
in some of these domains, they already don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about how Edurome works. I've got no idea how Edurome works, and I'm very glad that I don't have to know how Edurome works. And so we should have the same, same approach in developing the e-infrastructures that support our, our research service. So here we have, you know, the blue part is invisible, the red part is the same as it was, the researcher is working at the top of those um, domains uh, in an environment that isn't that different from what they're used to. The only difference they might notice is that get offered more things than they were previously being offered. The top part of this is about the curated FAIR data that we already talked about. The lowest part about this is the, the shared e-infrastructure. But the new thing is that the data across the middle, the data that the researchers used, is provenanced, is accessible, and is coming from a broader range of sources than they're currently used to. It's not just my data, it's everybody's data, and I have access to it as and when required. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, presentations. Uh, at the beginning, uh, in 2016, 17, when I first heard about EOSC, uh, I was completely confused. Mm -hmm. What is that? Uh, they mm -hmm. were, they were talking. They were talking about uh, organization uh, through which they will finance existing infrastructure, mm -hmm. all sort of stuff. But I think that lately things are getting clearer. Uh, so, uh, do you have any que questions for? Uh, well, uh, it's so we will get EOSC. Can you, can you predict when first services will be available through EOSC infrastructure? So this is, this is incremental. We already have an EOSC. It was launched last uh, November. Yeah. Um, and so there is a portal, the EOSC portal. You can go there. You can access services. There aren't so many services there at the moment, but it's a starting point. And as I said, this is like a snowball. You have to start from somewhere and build. If we wait till everything's ready and then build it all of a sudden, we'll never start. So we have to start and building things. So there are a bunch of services available there from data, cur data curation services to compute services and others already on the EOS portal. And then that will be added to over the coming years. Yeah, and so we will get uh, EOS on European level. Mm -hmm. So we member states now have, now we just can relax and not building our infrastructure because EOS could do it for us. Is that the case? Yeah. No, as I said, I think, you know, the vast majority of the research infrastructure is provided at national level and at university level. Um, that's without doubt, and that will continue. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is get better value from those existing infrastructures by sharing at a European level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, we uh, got a, a, a little exercise uh, about uh, building federated in infrastructure uh, with Edurom. We refer yes. to, to the Edurom a couple of times. Uh, we started with Edurom here in Slovenia 15 years ago. Uh, we established first access point at uh, the uh, fac Faculty for Social Sciences in the, the library. Uh, and um, it's what is worrying me is that some universities still didn't manage to put uh, the all, all the support mm -hmm. that users would need to uh, connect to the single sign on mm -hmm. authentication. So uh, w when universities hear about uh, the uh, common infrastructure in Europe, this should be a wait up call that they would build support for their users for some common e-services. Uh, and uh, with this... Yeah, uh, I, I completely uh, agree. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it's taken a long time to get a Jerome, 15 years. That's not really surprising. If you, if you look at a lot of technologies from the idea to the full maturity and universal availability. Mm. 20 years is not uncommon, um, you know, so it does actually take a very long time and we're trying to push things as fast as we can, but I think we have to be aware that this is a long-term project. Yeah. So, uh, will be probably crucial for Slovenia that uh, uh, the um, ministry will actually uh, 
pay attention to support uh, activities on open science, especially uh, supporting to create appropriate infrastructure, uh, like for uh, repositories, uh, long-term data storages, and also infrastructure for uh, access. Uh, we hope that this will that uh, that we will achieve this in the uh, next couple of years, and uh, I would thank you for uh, uh, to to our presenter on on EOS, and thank you thank you you for actually participating. Oh, sorry. Get the information that something will happen in Slovenia uh, with your support and support of mini Ministry. We have get the project, the uh, European Regional Project, uh, EOSC, uh, and Slovenia has two partners in it. Uh, the Greece is the coordinator, and we will uh, one of the many. But the first task is to organize to the national initiative, the com community for EOSC. Something will happen in the uh, near future, also in Slovenia. Yeah, good. Uh, I think it's essential that every country plays its part, and I mean every country. This can't just be something done by a few of the larger countries in Europe. It has to be done across the board. Um, so, you know, the, whatever is the national infrastructure has to be uh, sort of thought slightly differently. It's not about changing everything. It's just about trying to think how can we do this in a way that's going to make it interoperate better with the rest 